Hello everybody, this is Ryan Shields. I'm the youth minister here at St. Joseph's, and today we're going to talk a little bit about the Eucharist. All right, everyone. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the Eucharist, the sacrament of the Eucharist. You know, this is a cornerstone teaching of our church. And we have, uh, we know for, through research and through, you know, polling data and, and people, you know, talking, just talking with congregants, that the true presence in the Eucharist is something that uh, a lot of Catholics struggle with. So a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the Mass, um, but now we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about the Eucharist. And I could have done both of them together in one video, but I chose to separate them because I think I need to spend just a little bit more time on the Eucharist. And uh, most of us know the Eucharist as far as sacramentally from our first communion, but we receive this sacrament, we can receive it every day, you know. Uh, it's not just something that we have to only do on Sunday. We can go to daily mass, receive the Eucharist every day. I would definitely need to, uh, or definitely should be anyway, going to mass every week to receive the Eucharist. but just canonically, we're required to receive the Eucharist at least once a year. And how do we do that? Well, by and large, the most, uh, the most common way to receive the Eucharist is going to be through going to the Mass. Now, there are some different times, you know, if you're sick and in the hospital, you can't get to church, there might be a Eucharistic minister that comes around or a priest that comes around and, you know, gives you the Eucharist while you're in uh, the hospital and, or while you're sick. Um, they might go to your home and do it there. Uh, but by and large, most people are going to be receiving the Eucharist at Mass. Um, but like I said, there's a couple instances where you might be outside of mass and still receive the Eucharist. Um, but we're going to focus, you know, mostly on the mass and, and the Eucharist and how everything works. All right, let's get started on that. One of the things that I talked to the teens about a couple weeks ago when we talked about the mass was that although mass can be boring from time to time, um, that's not really what it's about, right? It's not about the music. It's not going to be about the preaching or anything like that. What Mass is really about is the true encounter with Jesus. We believe that Jesus is truly present in the, in the bread and in the wine, right? That the bread and wine are the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And this is one of the key things that, that, uh, that differentiates Catholics from other Christians. You see, this is a major stumbling block for a lot of people, but we believe in transubstantiation, meaning that the substance of bread and wine are no longer there, but the actual substance is going to be the body and blood of Christ. While the accidents, right, what you see might be bread and wine, what it is, the substance has changed into the body and blood of Christ. And we believe it's the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ all in one. And how do we get there, right? That's a pretty good question. So let's go a little bit into the history of the Eucharist. And to get there, we're gonna start in the Old Testament. If you remember the Old Testament, you might remember uh, Moses and getting the Israelites out of Egypt. During that time, one of the things that happens is the Passover. And the Passover is the last plague that uh, God puts onto Egypt in order to, to give in Pharaoh to let, the, let his people go, right? What happens is that a spirit of God comes into Egypt and takes the firstborn of every family. And while it's a little morbid and a little bit hard to think of God doing something like that, um, there's a lot more theology that leads to it. We're going to overlook that part of it. Right? But I want to focus on um, what happens with the Jewish families, because they are passed over by this spirit. How are they passed over by this spirit? Uh, well, what happens is they take a lamb, right, an unblemished lamb, they sacrifice the lamb, they smear its blood on the, the, the posts and over the, the, the header, kind of on the, on the, uh, the doorway of, of their house, and then they ate the uh the paschal lamb so the, the lamb is known as the paschal lamb because for the paschal sacrifice um passover sacrifice that lamb they ate it um, with unleavened bread and then they, they were supposed to eat it with their sandals on and their staffs in hand like they were ready to go um, and that feast that passover feast um, is what saved them from being you know, killed by the spirit of god the spirit of god passed over their houses because of the blood of the lamb on the, the doorposts and on the header. Um, and because of that, they were spared. They were saved. That 
Passover feast is something that's celebrated in the Jewish culture and in the Jewish faith to this day. And you'll notice that it's almost always right around Easter on the calendar. And it brings me to the next point, the next piece of history. The next piece of history is that the Last Supper was the Paschal Supper, was the Passover feast. So they were celebrating the Feast of Passover with Jesus and his disciples when we have the Last Supper. Before we get into the Last Supper, a couple things about that Passover feast. If you'll notice, the Spirit of God spared them. They were saved from death. That's going to be important to remember as we go forward. So the Passover feast saved them from death. Um, so just a little tidbit to remember as we go into the Last Supper. All right, now back to the Last Supper. All right, so at the Last Supper, uh, they're celebrating the Passover feast, and Jesus was known to be, you know, to hang out with the drunkards, right? We see the Pharisees accuse him of that. And Jesus, you know, came to save people. He came to convert people. Um, he's often said, he often says, you know, when the, when the king is here, you know, why are we, why are we mourning, right? Jesus was alive. God was there. Um, you know, they were feasting. They were having a good time. Um, and when we get to the Passover feast, the, the tenor of that feast kind of changes. Um, but we see a couple similar elements that we always see with Jesus, right? He's teaching them. He, he goes into, he, he washes their feet. He shows them what true service is. And then he institutes the Eucharist, right? He takes the bread and he says, this is my body given up for you. And he takes the, the wine and he said, this is my blood given up for you. And to truly understand the weight of these words, let's look back at a couple things that Jesus says during the Gospel of John that lead up to the Last Supper. All right, a couple of the a couple of the passages are going to be from John chapter six. In John chapter six, we're going to hear these three these couple things. Uh, right, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. That's verse thirty five. In verse fifty one, we hear, "I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever." And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh, right? Then another step forward. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life. And I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. That's verses 54 through 56. Now let's go back to the Last Supper. In the Last Supper, right, when we see God saying, or Jesus, God and Jesus, um, God the Son, Jesus, when we hear him say, this is my body, this is my blood, talking about the bread and the wine, this is the institution for the Eucharist. And every priest, who, when they stand up at the altar and they say those words of consecration, this is my body, this is my blood, they're not saying that about themselves, but they're standing in the person of Christ, saying the words of Christ, Instituting the Eucharist again, and not again, but we're taking part in that feast, in that Last Supper. So that event reverberates through time and space. And in, every time we go to the Eucharistic table, we're going to the table of the Last Supper. When Jesus hands us his body and blood, that becomes true, uh, true food and true, true drink. Um, those those uh, passages from John set up the fact that we have to believe that when we receive the Eucharist, that we are truly receiving the body and the blood of Christ. You know, Jesus is very plain in this, and it caused it was a, it caused a lot of tension. It was a hard teaching for a lot of people to come to grips with. And it still is a hard teaching for people to come to grips with, which is why a lot of people left the church over this, which is why there's still a lot of Catholics who struggle with it and maybe don't necessarily believe it. But it is real. It is true. Uh, we see this throughout time where the, the, the mass, you know, develops throughout the centuries, but it always keeps these essential elements in place. Why? Because they were in place at the Last Supper, right? When Christ instituted the Eucharist, when Christ instituted um, the, the reception of the body and blood of Christ. All right, now let's tie it together even more. Remember, remember what I told you to remember? Uh, remember it. You can go back a little bit if you have to and, and watch it again. But remember, before we started the Last Supper, the talk about the Last Supper, I told you to remember 
that the Passover feast saved the Israelites from death. Well, the Passover feast and the Last Supper, the Eucharistic table, is what saves us from sin and death. Remember, in the beginning, when the, the fall of Adam and Eve, right, we, we are no, we know death. When, when God said, um, you, will, you will die if you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, God said, if you eat of this, you will die. And God wasn't saying that you were going to be struck dead, right? That obviously didn't happen. What God was saying was that you would be able to die. You couldn't live forever in the garden anymore. Death was going to become an option. Sin and death are now open to us because of that original sin. In order to be saved from sin and death, what do we need? We need a Paschal sacrifice. We need a Passover feast that redeems us and saves us from death. Enter the Eucharist. Jesus dying like the Paschal lamb is killed and then being raised up is the completion of what we see previews of all throughout the Old Testament. So Jesus is the Paschal Lamb. He dies, and we eat his body, and we drink his blood, and that way we are saved from eternal death. The eternal life is open to us. We're saved from death through the Paschal sacrifice of Jesus Christ. This is why it's so important to receive the Eucharist. This is why it's so important to remain in a state where you can receive the Eucharist. We'll talk about reconciliation in a couple weeks, but all of, all of this, it's so important that we stay in the sacramental life of the church because it keeps us in a state where we can enjoy eternal life with God. The amazing thing that happened on Calvary opens us up to eternal life. And we see throughout salvation history, we see through this big long lens, like we've been talking about all year, that God was always working to redeem us. And in the Eucharist, we see our redemption. In the Paschal Feast, we see our redemption. And so why do we do, why is the Eucharist part of the Mass? Well, let's look at the Mass. The Mass, like we talked about last week, it's, it has its functions, and it's where we come together as a major liturgical celebration. But when we look at the ministry of Jesus, it's obvious why we do Mass the way we do. What would happen? People would come to Jesus. Jesus would teach them. After Jesus taught them, they would eat. We have the feeding, you know, the multiplication of the loaves and fishes. Uh, we have multiple times of Jesus sitting at the table, eating and drinking with different people. I mean, his very first miracle was at a wedding feast. Jesus taught, and then he ate. He taught, and then he ate. At the Last Supper, he teaches, and then he eats. When we go to Mass, we come together as a community, and we are taught through readings from the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Psalms, and the Gospels. We're taught by the homily, and then we eat. We come to the banquet, and we eat of the Paschal Sacrifice, the one that saves us. That's what happens at Mass. That's why we do things the way we do at Mass. And it all centers around the Eucharist. So like I told the teens, if you're bored in Mass, if you don't like the preaching, if you don't like the music, get over it. When we go to Mass, we're there to see Jesus face to face and to receive his body and blood in the bread and in the wine. And one last thing, um, just so I can kind of tie it up with a bow. We are called and we are bound to receive the sacrament of the Eucharist at least once a year. Once you receive First Communion, once you become a fully practicing Catholic, you're bound to receive the Eucharist at least once a year. Now, I'm not saying that you should only receive it once a year. What I'm saying is that you have to receive it at least once a year. So if it's been years since you've had, uh, since you've received the Eucharist, then you're no longer a practicing Catholic. That's just the way it goes. It's time to get to confession, and it's time to get back to the Eucharistic table. You see, Jesus is waiting for us, both in the sacrament of confession and then at the Eucharistic table. This is one of the most complex and amazing mysteries that the church has, and we're called to participate in it at least once a year. 
but I would call you to take it a step further. Try to go to Mass every Sunday. I understand that right now we have a special dispensation, and we don't have to go to Mass every single week. However, that dispensation is going to be lifted at some point. And at that point, we are going to be required to go to Mass every week again. And at that point, it's going to be a sin if you don't go. Now, know that if you're sick and can't make it to Mass, that's not a sin. If you try your best and you just can't make it, it's not a sin. However, under normal circumstances, you should be able to get to Mass every week. And that is what we're bound to as Catholics. It's a sin if we don't go. And add to that, that we should be going to confession regularly. We should be at a point where we can receive the Eucharist more than just that once a year that's the bare minimum. My challenge to you is to make sure you get to Mass every single week. Make sure you're in a state where you can receive the Eucharist every single week. Um, and if I haven't mentioned it before, um, I'll do it right here real quick. Uh, receiving, to receive the Eucharist, we have to be in line with the Church. When we say, Amen, we're saying, I believe. And we're saying that we believe what the Church teaches. So if we don't believe what the Church teaches, we cannot receive the Eucharist. If we're not Catholic, we cannot receive the Eucharist. If you're not in uh, or the right state with the church, you cannot receive the Eucharist. Meaning, if you have mortal sins on your soul, you cannot receive the Eucharist. You know, a mortal sin is something where you willfully do something that you know is wrong. Uh, it's a very simple uh, statement to make, and I understand that it's a little bit more complicated than that. But for the sake of time and what we're talking about here, know that if you have a mortal sin on your conscience, you need to get to confession before you can receive the Eucharist. But under normal circumstances, when you are not in a state of sin, and when you're in a state of grace, and you're at Mass on Sunday, you should be receiving the body and blood of Christ. Thank you so much for your time today. That's all we have on the Eucharist. I'm going to talk a little bit about our Saint of the Week, St. Catherine Drexel. St. Catherine Drexel, born in 1858 and died in 1955. Catherine Drexel was also known as Mother Drexel, and was a daughter of a wealthy Philadelphia banker. She devoted her life and considerable inheritance to serving the poor. She felt a special call to serve the African American and Native American communities in the United States. At the age of 30, she began preparations for religious life with the Sisters of Mercy. However, in 1891, when she pronounced her first vows, it was as the first member of the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament, which she founded. Catherine established more than a hundred missions and schools on Indian reservations, as well as in rural areas and cities. In 1915, she started a teacher's college that eventually became Xavier University of Louisiana, the first and only predominantly African-American Catholic university. Throughout her life, she fought for and founded civil rights causes. Today, the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament continue Catherine's gospel-inspired mission of witnessing to the power of the Eucharist by dedicating their whole lives to practicing justice and fostering unity among all peoples. Catherine was the second American-born saint and was canonized in October of 2000. Her feast day is March 3rd. Thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it so much. Um, if you haven't done it already, please subscribe to our page by clicking that subscribe button and click the bell so that you can be notified whenever we post something new. And as always, I would appreciate it if you liked and got something out of my video, if you would hit that like button as well. So until next time, take care and God bless.